good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever part of the world you are in. As uh, Alexandra said, uh, my name is Hamdi Eid. I am a senior uh, solution architect with Amazon Web Services, have been there for three years. And without any further ado, uh, as Alexandra said, we are going to talk about security on AWS. So today we'll be covering uh, several topics. Uh, before I go get into the AWS security uh, aspects of it and the shared responsibility model, I would like to cover uh, at least at the high level how traditional development is uh, different from modern development using things like serverless and containers technology. And uh, I'm going to follow that by um, talking about the specific ways you can secure workload, uh, things like um, the uh, shared responsibility model, the principle of least privilege, uh, how to do defense in depth at different layers, the architecture. And then I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Andrea, who's going to talk about the AWS World Architecture Framework, uh, with uh, focus on the security pillar, as well as uh, security uh, best practices. Next slide, please. All right, so before we start talking about uh, security specific uh, aspects or, or services of it from AWS, um, you probably have seen a similar uh, slide like the one you're looking at now. Traditionally, uh, we have developed application in a three tier model, right? Uh, where you have your web servers in the presentation layer, you have your uh, business logic in the application server tier, and then you have your data in the obviously in the data tier or data uh, database uh, services tier. Um, this architecture actually still works today. I mean, there's nothing something that is working. We have customers in AWS that still use it. However, there are a couple of challenges with that uh, with the kind of architecture. First, you have all the layers are actually connected together. So you have one big monolithic application uh, that you have to deploy, monitor, uh, and so on. Uh, is, is, there's no breakdown between those components, meaning if you have a change in the presentation layer, that is going to um, uh, filter down to the logic layer and the data layer as well. Uh, the second concern of those kind of architecture is these don't scale well, uh, because uh, the way you scale this is that you scale vertically or horizontally, so you have to add more servers, more nodes. Uh, that changes. This picture changes drastically when you talk about modern application development, for example, using serverless technology. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so when we talk about um, serverless, for example, or modern application design, I think there are uh, five key terms that we for us to focus on. The first one is what we call features first. What that means is uh, the previous slide I explained, you know, how all the layers are connected together, uh, the application is one big piece, you deploy it together, and so on. Uh, it's very tightly coupled. Uh, so features first, uh, meaning uh, modern applications tend to be composed of features and functions. Uh, each of those uh, features will represent a function within the application, and you piece them loosely together. Uh, that will help you avoid that monolithic thinking, that one big piece, and uh, the thinking there is just thinking, you know, that server is an unit, atomic unit of work. The second tenant is focus on events. Events are the workhorse or the focus of serverless and container application or modern application in general. Why? Because events is what actually triggers uh, your workload. It could be an IoT uh, push button. Uh, it could be a message arriving on a queue uh, and so on. That what kicks off your, your uh, serverless uh, workload. So events are at the heart, and AWS is a very rich ecosystem uh, of events, uh, whether it's AWS services or our integration with other external services, like for example Kafka and so on. Uh, stateless, uh, that one could that tenant could be very hard to grasp for some people, and the reason is because when you come from a traditional background, you typically deploy everything to a single server, and like I said before, you need to scale, you add more servers. So the server becomes everything, basically, for deployment, for monitoring, and so on. So where does the state go? Uh, the state is still there, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, later. Uh, typically, we keep the state uh, in um, DynamoDB, for example, our NoSQL database. Uh, but the, the stateless of the application is actually the key to scaling. The fourth thread is data flow. We want you to think early on 
on how you're going to manage your data. Think about what kind of data types you're dealing with. Are you dealing with structured data, like sales records, for example, unstructured data, uh, images, documents, and so on? Because thinking about it early in the process will help you uh, choose the right fit uh, the, the database, uh, basically, or, or uh, uh, the data backend. And the last step is the, is the easy one. Let's use the service, meaning don't reinvent the wheel. But a lot of managed services, as you will see throughout the presentation, that you can use to piece things together. Next slide, please. All right, so what does the landscape look like for a modern application? Well, besides, you're going to see a lot more, you know, um, uh, regions, uh, availability zones, a lot more AWS icons uh, on the screen. There are also certain things that will change and certain things that will remain constant. For example, um, the modern application used to be a uh, of small components that compose like a building block, basically. And that you loosely, loosely join them together. So it's not tightly coupled at all, it's the opposite. And uh, there are key aspects that doesn't change, uh, change that does change actually. For example, uh, services in a modern development are ephemeral, meaning the service don't, don't tend to stick around. For example, Lambda function is executed, you know, there's, there's a lifetime for the function, 15 minutes max executions in the execution runtime goes away. And if you need an, if you need another lambda function, it will instantiate another runtime environment for you. So the service themselves are ephemeral, they do the work and they move on. The second part that changes is it is a diffuse parameter. What I mean by a diffuse parameter is not it's not one big monolithic piece anymore. It's actually those loosely uh, uh, joined pieces that you use API calls to connect them together uh, most of the time. Uh, and the third one that does change is the fine grain access control. So from a security perspective, now each of those services, you know, have their own fine grain security controls that you can actually configure at the service level. Configuring a Lambda basic execution IAM role is going to be different than configuring an S3 bucket, uh, bucket policy permission uh, and so on. But we have a service called IAM or Identity Access Management. That one is constant. That one does not change. Uh, if you do have a diffuse parameter, that one really does does not change and that gives you a lot of control over defining roles and permissions within AWS from a security perspective. Uh, the fourth thing also that the change is the tooling around it. When we develop modern application, typically we use what we call you know Amazon um, CDK, which is Cloud Development Kit. It's uh, basically a thin layer uh, that runs on top of our uh, infrastructure as code, Cloud Formation. And makes it develop a lot easier. It can support uh, several programming languages, or we use what we call SAM or Serverless Application Model, and that is uh, one of the tools that we use uh, to develop serverless application that also runs on top of cloud formation as a thin layer. Um, so the things that change, things that do not change is you still have to secure the, your data, right? So you still have to do the encryption using the service we provide. You still have to write good code because even though we provide with a very solid base services in terms of security, uh, our bad editing code can expose uh, your application. Uh, next slide, please. So with that being said, uh, security uh, for us on AWS is job zero, meaning it comes above everything else. Uh, that's how important it is. And AWS, we use what's called a shared responsibility model. Now, I'm not sure if you've seen a slide like that or a similar one in, in the past, maybe, but our shared responsibility model in AWS will take care of security in the cloud, while we expect our customers to take care of security, uh, I'm sorry, security over the cloud and the customer take care of their security in the cloud. What does that mean is, we take, uh, for example, we secure our physical our facilities, our data centers, our edge locations, we also secure our core services like compute, storage, database, and networking. But you, the customer, are you still responsible for securing security in the cloud? Meaning, you're still uh, responsible for securing your data. If you're doing your, uh, for example, SSL uh, encryption, uh, in transit, in, uh, the encryption transit, uh, encryption at rest, and so on. But we uh, provide you with several tools. Like KMS, for example, or certificate management, management, or um, 
you know, uh, encryption services and so on. And I am in order for you to be able to do these things. Ms. Ra, please. OK, so this line is so in the middle that that, that defines where the responsibility ends, where the customer starts. That line is not constant, meaning that line does change actually when you start using managed services. If you remember this slide I showed you before, all those loosely cobbled pieces. Uh, so more of the responsibility of security shifts to AWS when you use managed services because we manage those services on your behalf, hence managed services. Um, but they still have, of course, they have the, uh, some responsibility, but you can uh, add more uh, more to that. Uh, like for example, we provide security for uh, our Lambda functions, uh, API gateway, step functions, uh, all the different ser many services that we provide. So the sh this responsibility shifts more to AWS. You have to do less, but it's still responsible for, for the still security is not free. It's still responsible for securing your data. Next slide, please. OK, least privilege. Like as I mentioned in the agenda slide, uh, uh, someone has a question. I'm Mr. For a minute. Is there a question, uh, Alexander? No, not yet. I'm sorry. OK, sorry. So uh, my bad. So uh, least privilege, as I mentioned in the agenda slide, uh, the least privilege is really a very important, but yet it's a very basic concept uh, to grasp. What that means basically is a set of essential privileges that you need to perform the intended work. I Meaning don't give, we always advise our customers, don't be too permissive in the beginning. Meaning we see customers with the, the, the grant a lot of permissions for services, application, or even users, and then they find out that it's too permissive, let's try to, to curtail that or you know, cut it back down a little bit. My recommendation is start small, right? Don't get, don't be too, too permissive in the beginning. Start with only the set of permissions the user or the service need, and then add more as you go. Uh, you can always do that using, you know, our IAM, identity and access management uh, services, uh, what we call execution roles. But every resource within AWS houses an S3 bucket or a Lambda function or an event bus. Um, Rule should have its own uh, uh, resource policies, and we provide of, of the resource policies for, for almost all of our services. You also need to be specific, meaning you need to identify the limited set of resources with the actions allowed. Um, you will see some of the policies, even I, uh, um, AWS policies, have an asterisk in it. So, with expired, that means the resource have access to everything. Um, you can access everything within the resource. So. Will advise you to actually scrutinize that use. Uh, that use might be uh, okay in some cases, but for example, if you're accessing a database, an asterisk is probably not a good idea uh, to use it in a resource policy. Next slide, please. Okay, so continuing on with IAM access, like I said, IAM is really the service that you need to, to understand in depth. And we're not covering the details of, I, uh, of IAM in this presentation, but there's a barcode at the top right. Uh, of the slide decks that you can scan, and that will take the IAM deep dive uh, talk. Uh, for example, uh, when we use uh, a Lambda function to access an S3 bucket, right? You have a different kind of policies, resource policies you can use. From an API standpoint, uh, you have what we call control plane actions that manage things like, for example, creating a Lambda function or updating a state machine or something, a workflow. But you also have a data plane action that excuse the daily business, like invoking the actual function or putting a message in a queue. Um, so, and overall, you have all those kind of policies. You have the IAM policy as talked about earlier, but you have also, as if you have multiple AWS accounts, we have uh, a service called uh, AWS organization, allow you to do a multiple account security for multiple accounts. And you can see that called the SCB, service control policies. So from a security standpoint, you can say, well, the only limited set of users can use those resources, right, within my organization. And that will filter down to all accounts within the organization. You also have resource policies that can be set as a resource level. Like an, uh, a good example, S3 bucket policy. You can you can make it like a read only, for example, or you can, you know, you can uh, make it uh, read only, but uh, with right capability for, for, you know, for database, for database, but for a specific principle and so on. 
there is uh, advanced topics like I'm uh, permission boundaries. <coughs> Excuse me, that you can do I am as well. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. OK, all right. So we talked about resource policies and I'll direct distinguish between resource policies and execution rules. So resource policies define what you can do in the resource itself. What can be done in the resource itself? The execution rule defines what the service can access uh, or can talk to other services. For example, a Lambda execution rule, basic execution rule, will have the permission within it to tell, to say what Lambda function can do with access to the backend database, for example, right? Or, for example, in the diagram you're seeing, what event bus can invoke uh, on event bus in account A, you can have two accounts, account A and account B, and then you have an event bus in both accounts. So you can have a resource policy or a future role on account A that can say, okay, event bus A can invoke a Lambda function in, in account B, and so on. Next slide, please. Um, Finally, I talked about um, you know shared responsibility model, but but I would like to give you just a, a walk through an example. And the example I would like to provide you is for a serverless application, but, but but the principle applies to anything really. Uh, to kind of workloads, or uh, serverless containers, or or machine learning. Uh, the idea is always have um, always have security at different layers of your application. Let's say you have a uh, uh, so I'm going to walk through a, a request response operation. So let's say you have a request coming in to access one of your web, web, web pages that's handled by one of your uh, API-based web applications. Um, the first layer is obviously the security, the edge security. So you have a client sending in a request, okay, and that request coming typically to a DNS server. So uh, you have, it, so it all starts with HTTPS uh, for enabling encryption in transit. And we have services that help with that, obviously. Um, so you have an HTTPS request coming in uh, that hits your DNS server. It does a DNS query, and the, the assuming using some kind of a CDN, a content delivery network that hits your content delivery network, and that's when the authentication authorization process start, it starts. So um, you can use uh, this example. I use the management tool like Cognito, or you can use Microsoft Active Directory, whatever, or Okta, whatever user management. Uh, uh, you have set, for, set up your application. Uh, it's going to try to authenticate the application. In doing so, I talked a lot about uh, uh, IAM, Identity Access Management, and roles, policy roles, uh, resource uh, execution roles, and resource roles, uh, resource policies. So uh, the user management service will talk to IAM, trying to get that those role and see what kind of permissions the role have. And once it gets that, it will return an access token with permission back to the client. Now the client is going to use some kind of an ABI and that access token and try to talk to call uh, the ABI, for example, a get or a put or a post request, trying to get some some kind of data from your data from your back end. Um, at the at the point, the requests have gone also with the API gateway. So you have done edge security using CloudFront or R33, and also uh, I would like to mention for the CloudFront, for example. Uh, it has a built-in DDoS uh, protection, so the denial of service attack is built into CloudFront, uh, but it's basic uh, DDoS protection. If you want an advanced one, uh, either this does offer a, a Shield Advanced. Uh, there's also, you can also integrate our WAV, which is the application firewall with CloudFront. So when you deploy your CloudFront, you can set up web application firewall or even a third-party firewall like an F5, and that will protect you against common uh, web vulnerability, right? Things like cross-site scripting, for example, uh, or a SQL injection. And and then you have the user management layer, and then you have the API layer or, or API gateway in this example, or it could be an app sync in, in, in the case of GraphQL uh, application. Uh, so once the API goes gets to the API layer, that's your, you know your business, your entry point basically to the application. It will have that access to the gut from IEM, right? Uh, but ABI Gateway does not allow yet access to the back end at this point, even with access token. It needs to go back, it will go back actually and validate that access token with the user management uh, component, which in this case Cognito, right? Our user management tool. 
um, and it will to make sure that the requester is not impersonating anybody. Correct. And incognito is a lot of uh, security features. You can also send incognito, including MFA, multi factor authentication, of course, your digital, you know, passwords and user IDs and so on. Uh, once the gateway authenticated says it's a valid request, a valid user, then it allows the request to go through, then it goes to your business logic layer, which is in this case your Lambda function. Lambda function has a business logic, okay, says, okay, this request is a, it's a get request, it's requesting some data from, from database. Uh, the Lambda also have an IEM uh, basic execution role in it, and that IEM role has permissions. So from a security perspective, the permission will define what Lambda can do with DynamoDB. Can it actually, does it only allow to read from DynamoDB or can it write to DynamoDB? What exactly can, can Lambda do from a security perspective? That's controlled by the IAM execution role. Let's assume in this example, the IAM execution role allows the get, uh, read write. So it will go to DynamoDB, get the record and send it back to Lambda as a JSON document, okay? And then the entire payload will go back, travel the same way until it gets back to the, uh, to the client, in, uh, to the client application. So that's just a, a quick example of end-to-end -end and how we inject security uh, through different layers of your AWS architecture. With that, I would like to turn it over to my colleague, Andrea, who's going to walk us through the World Architecture Framework with focus on the security pillar. Indeed, thank you very much for your presentation and, and um, telling us about all these security tools that we can use. Um, we do have um, a question in our chat, and I will re read um, some of them that we have. Uh, and the, the one that we have is, could you emphasize using VP securely? Sorry, I, I'm going to talk about that. So okay. I, I will suggest to wait for a little because I'm specifically talking about that. Perfect. Um, we have another one. Just uh, um, we will just read the ones that we have right now, and then at the end of your presentation, Andres, we can we can cover those. Um, it says, "How do I protect my web applications against common vulner vulnerabilities?" Sure. So that's a good question, actually, uh, because protecting against your web vulnerability uh, it really starts with edge security, right? So it all starts HTTPS enabled on your application. We typically, as I mentioned previously, we typically will command some kind of a CDN, like you know, a content delivery network, because those have a built-in DDoS protection, and they also uh, most of them, almost all of them, are, uh, are integrated with some kind of a firewall, right? Uh, in the case of AWS, we will call it WAF, or Web Application Firewall. Now, the Web Application Firewall has built-in rules. They'll protect your application against those common web vulnerabilities, such as SQL injection, result scripting, and again, CloudFront has DDoS protection built in, and you can always use AWS Sheet Advanced if you want to advance DDoS protection. However, for your API-based applications, we also, for the API Gateway, if you remember the example I showed you the security walkthrough, uh, for the API protection, uh, we have different throttling levels that you can define your API Gateway. Uh, you can define the throttling as account level, you can define as the API stage level, or you can define even at the method level. And that throttling will help defend against common web attacks and reduce the service attack for you. Okay, thank you, Hamdi. I will read one more before I pass it on to Andres. Sure. Um, what kind of data protection services can I use in microservice applications? Okay, uh, so that really depends on the type of application, but in general, uh, we do offer a lot of services. Uh, the most notable one for data protection is what we call KMS or Key Management, Amazon Key Management Service, because that allows you to do the data encryption very easily by creating, uh, by allowing you to create and manage uh, cryptographic keys. And then you can use those, key, those keys across a wide range of, of AWS services and applications. Uh, um, I can say 100% confident all AWS services support KMS, all right? and do uh, uh, at risk uh, encryption. You can also uh, protect your data using AWS Secret Manager or our parameter store. What Secret Manager does enables, as the name implies, allows you to create, rotate, manage, and retrieve your database credentials, for example, your API keys, and other secrets throughout the life cycle. So instead of having to hard code any uh, 
computational information app, you use uh, secret, secret manager to retrieve those credentials at, uh, dynamically at runtime. Um, and the last thing I would like to add, if you, for example, dealing with sensitive information that like banking information or healthcare, uh, like PHI, top information like, you know, uh, healthcare information, uh, medical records, you can use uh, Amazon MIS, which is a fully managed data security. And they're a private service that actually uses machine learning algorithms to discover and protect your sensitive data in AWS. Thank you, Handy. Now I'll pass it on to Andres, who's, I'm oh, sorry, did I interrupt you, Handy? No, Good. you're fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, now I'll pass it on to Andres, who's our head of security infrastructure in NUB 8. He will be speaking about the importance of the well architected review and during periodic reviews in your architecture. Um, so welcome, Andres. It's all Thank yours. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Alexa. So, uh, hello and welcome again, everyone, to our webinar. Uh, in this section, we'll be diving into the AWS Well Architected Framework, uh, which is a powerful tool uh, that helps you make informed decisions while building systems on AWS. Could you please be beep? Okay, so first of all, the AWS Well Architected Framework is a guide, right? Uh, it can help you to design and to operate workloads in the cloud. It provides uh, valuable insights and practices to assess and to optimize your solutions consistently. So let's dive deeper into the specifics because the framework is based on six pillars. The operational excellence uh, that focus on running and monitoring systems for continuous improvement and smooth operations. The security pillar, uh, safeguard information, assets, and systems by assessing risks and implementing protection strategies. The reliability, ensure that systems can recover from disruptions, handle misconfigurations, and scale uh, as your business really needs. Uh, performance efficiency, it's all about optimized computing resources to meet system requirements uh, efficiently. Uh, the cost optimization pillar is uh, to avoid unnecessary expenses and maximize uh, value. And the sustainability one is to minimize environmental footprint by reducing uh, resource uh, usage. Today, uh, we focus on the security pillar. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, uh, we all know that security is crucial uh, in the cloud, right? And AWS offers a variety of services and tools uh, for granting control, for auditability, and visibility for cloud resources and workloads. Uh, the security pillar has a number of principles that can help you improve your workload security. Uh, the idea is uh, to, to make a, a brief review through the foundations of these principles. So first, you need to implement list privilege, separate duties, and centralized identity management. Then you need to monitor, alert, and audit actions and changes in real time. Um, you need to employ a defense in-depth approach with multiple security controls, uh, use automated software-based uh, security mechanisms, uh, classify data based on sensitivity and use encryption, tokenization, and access control. Um, minimize direct access or manual processing of data. That's very important. And uh, the last one is to establish incident management policies and conduct uh, response simulations. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so uh, based on that, the security pillar is also composed of six areas, and we want to review that today, right? Because that's the, the important input for our businesses. So first of all, there is Identity and Access Management, or IM. Um, uh, this grants users or applications access to resources with robust identity management and permissions. Uh, detection is identify security misconfigurations, threats, uh, are unexpected behavior. The infrastructure protection, it's about control methodologies like defense in depth to meet best practices and organizational or um, even regulatory obligations, ensuring uh, the successful ongoing cloud operations. 
The data protection is to implement practices such as data classification and encryption to safeguard sensitive information, uh, prevent mishandling, and comply with uh, regulatory requirements. The incident response uh, is to establish mechanisms to respond to and, and mitigate the impact of security incidents. And the last one uh, is AppSec that focus on designing, building, and testing security properties of your workloads. Uh, okay, so let's develop uh, each of these points. Uh, please, next slide. Okay, so I am uh, is a tool to support the principle of least privilege within an organization's security culture. Okay, that's very important. It emphasizes the importance of a strong authentication and only providing access to data and resources for those who really require it. Uh, a recommended approach for this uh, is to begin by denying access to all and then grant permissions based on job roles. Um, please, next slide. Uh, in this, in identity and access management, AWS has limited the uh, access points to their cloud, allowing monitoring uh, for inbound and outbound communications. These access points, uh, which are called API endpoints, are vital for interacting with AWS services, and we have multiple options. We have the AWS Management Console, which uh, is a web interface accessible through any standard browser, uh, you have the, the command line interface, uh, which facilitates automation with commands, or maybe you are more um, attached to, to that approach. That's fine. You, you have everything you may need in the CLI of AWS. And we have the SDKs, which are usable functions made to specific programming languages and platforms. Uh, the next, please. Okay, so the second one is detection. Uh, we have config, we, we have artifact. Uh, those are vital services for managing compliance and monitoring your AWS environment. Uh, for enhanced traceability and security, you have CloudTrail, you have CloudWatch, you have even Bridge uh, that enable real time log collection and monitoring. Uh, by using these services, you can, uh, you can effectively manage compliance, ensure security, um, and overall enhance traceability, promoting a robust, secure cloud infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, for infrastructure protection, you have this, um, uh, and this one, this was one of the questions. Um, these are essential security services. You, you need to use those. Uh, each provide unique features uh, and benefits. Uh, with this, you can safeguard your infrastructure and reduce the attack surface. And let's make a, a brief stop on Amazon BPC. This basically enables you to create a private, isolated network within your AWS environment. Um, this allows you to control and secure your virtual network environment. And some recommendations will be use private subnets. So you need to place resources that don't need direct internet access in private subnets. And um, this reduces their exposure to external threats. You also can um, use network ACLS and security groups. The ACLS uh, control inbound and outbound traffic uh, at the subnet level. Um, with security groups, you can apply um, those to the instance level to control traffic based on port protocol, limiting access to require resources only. You can enable uh, BPC flow logs to monitor and capture information about IP traffic flowing to and from uh, the network interfaces of your BPC. Uh, this facilitates security analysis and incident response. So um, I think that that will be the, the main recommendations for protecting your BPC, and maybe that um, answers the question. Uh, with WAF um, uh, and with Shield, you have a, a web application firewall to protect your web applications from common web exploits and attacks, such as SQL injection and cross-site scripting. With Shield, your applications um, are protected against a distributed denial of service or DDoS attacks. Um, you can have a BPC endpoints um, 
that, that will be for the BPC uh, security recommendations. Um, you can securely access AWS services such as S3 or DynamoDB from within your BPC without needing um, access to the public internet. Um, with Inspector, um, you have a security assessment services that helps you identify security vulnerabilities and deviations from best practices in your applications deployed on AWS. Um, please, the next slide. Okay, for data protection, um, we know that safeguarding data is crucial in information systems. So AWS provides services like KMS and Secrets Manager, and Hamdi was talking about that, um, because with those you, you have the ability to protect your data using encryption in transit and encryption in rest. Um, effective data safeguarding includes fine-grained access control, uh, to limit unauthorized data access, you have to the ability to manage encryption keys. You can use the, the appropriate encryption methods based on your needs. You can validate your data integrity and uh, you can establish data retention policies. Okay, for incident response, um, we all know that we need and we um, must implement services to respond to incidents, right? So we have incident manager, which is uh, inside the session manager. We have a step functions. We can use cloud formation and SNS. How? Uh, with incident manager, um, um, it will help us to, to, to the resolution of any incident, allowing you to create response plans, uh, assign roles, uh, automate uh, key steps during any incident. With a step functions, you can coordinate workflows with a, 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 a many, um, um, a, a large amount of other AWS services. With CloudFormation, you can manage and deploy resources consistently. You could have a template to respond to a specific incident or something like that. Uh, and you can use SNS to send alerts to keep the stakeholders informed or, or even you like uh, uh, a manage a whole package and manage system that you can develop uh, tailored to your needs. Okay, so um, yes, um, please the next slide because before we continue, um, I, I like to summarize some of the security best practices we have been reviewing. So uh, we talk about the appropriate authentication and authorization mechanisms. Um, always use and think in the least privileged principle. Uh, principle. Um, always store all of your secrets and your data in a secure way. Um, always be aware of what is your uh, sensitive data and how to storage that data, only the data that you really need and of course protect that data in rest and also in transit please next slide okay also as hamdi was explaining previously uh, it is important to adopt secure coding practices uh, leverage monitoring tools to enhance secure posture enable comprehensive logging for all components uh, refrain from logging sensitive data and conduct regular configuration audits Okay, now about managing credentials and authentications, we have, for example, to enable MFA uh, for the root user and avoid to use access keys for that root user. That's very, very important. That is one of our uh, mainly recommendations for any new AWS account that you create. Uh, set strong password policies, enforce MFA for all your IAM users, regularly rotate credentials and audit those credentials for security, integrate with an identity provider for centralized authentication um, because you can use single sign-on or you can create applications to use that identity provider to, to log in into your AWS application. So that's a, a very good practice. For uh, protecting your network, let's talk about protecting your network and compute resources. Um, use Amazon BPC with different subnets, network ACLS, uh, ACLs, and security groups to control traffic, as we already talked. 
implements application level filtering with a WAF to protect against uh, threats, uh, integrate AWS services for a centralized and automated approach to network security, uh, limit access to the minimum required following always the principle of least privilege. Uh, about compute resources, make a regular vulnerability scanning and patching, use automated secure configurations, um, use always only secure AMIs, uh, and use intrusion, intrusion protection and prevention. Uh, for detective controls, define requirements based on organizational and compliance needs and evaluate AWS services that meet those requirements. Uh, centralized log collection and automated log analysis for anomaly detection. Uh, establish baselines, uh, set up alerts, uh, and automate anomaly detection with uh, machine learning, for example. Um, and finally, it's also important to continuously review and refine controls to improve security. Now let's talk uh, about incident response. So to continuously enhance incident response capabilities, we need to maintain a list of key personnel and tools, automate incident containment. You need to develop detailed Rombox. Those are very handy in a crisis situation. Uh, conduct road cost analysis, uh, pre-provision correct access, access in AWS, uh, run simulated incident response uh, events for learning and adaptability. And finally, yeah, and finally for uh, AppSec, the recommendations that you need to implement are to provide a secure development training, always automate uh, security testing, conduct a uh, regular penetration testing, perform in-depth manual code reviews. Those are, are, are pretty handy. Uh, centralized services for validated software packages, use good practices for software deployments, uh, apply security pillar principles to pipelines, and uh, empower builder teams for security decisions. Uh, all right, uh, this was the information I wanted to share with all of you today. I hope these security recommendations and the brief overview of some AWS services will help you to enhance your security posture within uh, AWS. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Andres. Thank you for your presentation and your insights in how the Well Architecture Framework could help architects build the most secure, high-performing, resilient, and efficient infrastructure. Um, we do have a couple of questions, so I will both ask um, you, Andres, and Hamdi. Um, mm -hmm. One of them is, how can security risks be identified and mitigated in a well architected review, and how can AWS and NUB8 assist in this process? I don't know, mm -hmm. um, Andres. Yeah, le yeah. Let me let me answer that. I think that I identified uh, and mitigating security risks in a um, well architected review involves evaluating security controls, right? You need to access management, you need to have data protection, you need to check your uh, network security. So you can use AWS services like uh, we spoke, IAM, WAF, KMS to assist you in uh, strengthen your security. Um, you can use Security Hub, uh, you have GuardDuty, um, because those offer you like monitoring and threat detection. Um, uh, about the new way and how we can help you is that um, as we are a, a very experienced provider and we also have a managed services um, uh, offer, um, we can offer to our customers the expertise that we already have in conducting a thorough reviews, implementing best practices, um, provide monitoring and incident response services, and um, overall enhance the, the security in any AWS environment. Thank you, Andres. Um, we have another question here in the chat. I know Hamdi has already answered it here, but just in case you want to add anything, it says, what steps can organizations, um, I'm sorry, I think, what steps can organizations take to ensure that we that well-architected principles are continually applied and re refined as technology and business needs evolve? Sure, uh, let me take that. <clears throat> so, um, 
as Andrea was saying, we have this tool, right, that's built into right into the AWS Management Console called uh, Well Architected Tool, and that tool covers um, all the pillars. So each of the each of those pillars will have the design principles, and within each design principle, you have a set of best practices that we learn. This this tool basically combines over 15 years of uh, AWS Solution Architects expertise back in the tool. So the best way for organization to keep on top of the security is to have the workload reviewed, I would say at least twice a year, okay, if not more. So because when you go through those work that reviews, you definitely covering secure security aspects of it, but you also have uh, covering performance, reliability, uh, cost optimization, and so on. And all and, 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 and monitoring, right? Uh, because monitoring is important for security, um, especially if you are using things like containers and several lists, which you don't have many services, which has di you don't have direct visibility into the service. Uh, so you can use uh, tracing services like AWS X-Ray, right? Or, or, mm -hmm. And, and CloudWatch. And the tool covers all that. So my best recommendation is use the well architect tool. Uh, utilize a partner like Nope 8 who can help you run the tool the first time so you can get familiar with it if you're not familiar with it. Uh, that would be the best uh, advice I'll give uh, in this respect. Thank you, Hamdi. Sure. Um, th there's another question here, and maybe you can answer Hamdi or Andres. It says, how do I know my code has not been changed? Very good question. So, yeah, uh, so the best service I know for this is uh, code signer. And that's used by AWS Lambda, and the code signer it does inspect your package when because the way Lambda operates, for example, uh, you upload your uh, your code and the code is, is is packaged into an S3 bucket, and when you use the code signer, it uses SIG4, signature four, uh, and it does check your code to see if it has changed from the last time that that before you actually upload it. So code signature is the best one of the best ways you can do at least for serverless applications. Uh, Alex, Andrea, want to add anything else? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you you have, for example, the possibility to use version control. You you have a, a version control system like Git. Uh, AWS has a service called Code Commit and a, a whole package uh, for that. Um, with those services, you can deploy a pipeline, so you can set up a CI/CD uh, pipeline that automate the deployment process. And um, I think that those will be good methods to check and to ensure that uh, your code is not being uh, changed. Uh, for example, you have code signing and hash and verification, so you can use those two. Um, and, and always, uh, as we have been said, uh, a secure deployment will guarantee you that uh, your code is, is secure. Perfect. Um, another question we have in the chat, it says, what do you think for AWS certification? So it says, do, is it worth spending time and money in the certifications? Finally, do you advise to get the AWS certificates? Somebody else, somebody in the chat is talking about, about that. Okay. Andrea, you want to take that? Yeah. Okay. yeah uh, <laughs> I, I can answer as uh, myself. I, I always try to to learn new things and to prepare and certify in AWS. So I think that uh, it, it mostly depends on your role and what you really want and what are your business needs, right? For example, me as a cloud security engineer, uh, it gives me credibility. Um, I know and I, I think that we already know that it is an industry demand to be certified in a cloud computing um, um, with cloud computing knowledge. Um, it, it can help you to advance in your career. You can uh, validate your skills because there are many people and uh, very good engineers that uh, they have a, a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge, right, Hamdi? But maybe they don't have a certification so they can validate those skills. And I think that an AWS certification helps you to prove uh, uh, on the first communication that you already have that experience and you can like demonstrate the, that. So yeah, I think that 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 it's good. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah, I would just like to take quickly. Um, totally agree with Andrea. Uh, I'm a bit over there. I work for AWS, so I'm a bit biased here, but it does show credibility when you are certified mm. because 
AWS exam tend to be very difficult to pass, uh, so an employers know that. Mm. So when you when you have the badge, they, they know at least at the minimum you have uh, you know the, the best knowledge, and uh, just like any other with any technology, the best way to do this uh, is certification forces you to get that hands-on experience, right? In order to mm. pass, example, the mm. sys ops yeah. certification gotcha. is a hands-on part of it. So it forces you to get your hands dirty, and I think that's a big advantage. And if you are th if you're new to AWS and you're thinking about uh, certification, I would strongly recommend it, and I would recommend starting with AWS Solution Architect Associate certification, because this one is going to give you the broad range of AWS level, level 200 intermediate knowledge of uh, the most commonly used AWS services, and will give you the foundation to go into something more specific, like for example, the security specialist certification. So start with associate uh, solution architect, and then you can dive into security certification. Perfect. We have a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to read two more questions, and then because I know um, uh, our time is coming up. So one of them is says, how do I best secure my application throughout the development lifecycle? I think that's more towards you, Hamdi, maybe. Sure, through so the development lifecycle. So um, the best way to do this is using uh, some of the provided services. Like I use a lot, you know, I typically use uh, KMS, key management services, because this allows you to mm. use either an AWS uh, managed key or a custom managed key. And uh, some of the services you can create your own custom key, like for SQS and SNS, for example. Um, also, during development, I would, like Andrea was saying, I would definitely use a CI CD uh, service like AWS Code Commit uh, to secure my code. Uh, it's a code deploy to uh, run my unit testing, I mean, integration testing, and that integrates with other you know, third party tools as well. Like, for example, um, uh, it can integrate with, with Python. If you have Python code, you can use it with PY test tool, right? Right from from code build, so that secures uh, uh, your code during development. Also, lets you identify bugs early in the process. So during unit integration testing, and then you can use code pipeline, which can actually uh, do a canary deployment or a green green uh, blue green deployment. So you can mm -hmm. gradually test your code, and uh, so you're not taking the risk, right? So you can gradually shift trafficking. That's not maybe a 5% rule or 10% rule, and then increase traffic to, to the new code. So those are a couple of things you can actually do during development security uh, your workload during development time. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you can <coughs> uh, use like a, a multiple layer uh, deployment, right? Because you you have your perimeter layer, <coughs> you can use WAF, you have your right. network layer, you use the, the BPC, the security groups, all, all right. that uh, we talk about. You have the identity and access control using IAM. You have the encryption uh, at rest and in transit. Um, you have, of course, the secure coding practices, as Hamdi was saying, uh, static code analysis. Then you you could use like a monitoring and logging layer with CloudTrail, CloudWatch, and so on. You can have even an incident response layer. Um, you could use config rules uh, and automate incident response. Uh, you can implement a backup and recovery layer. So, yeah, uh, it, at the end, it depends on how big will be your deployment or how complex will be um, the the solution that you are working on. Because, uh, of course, any of these layers, uh, you can like not implement that in a very complex way because maybe you don't even need it. Uh, and we are not saying that the security on any of this layer is not important, but um, I think that the cloud allows you that flexibility to use only what you really need and to implement the security based on the application needs, right? So you are not obligated to use a lot of services and a lot of security layers and use everything that AWS has to offer about security because it is a lot, right, Hamdi? Yes, that's exactly right. right? It, really, mm. it, is, uh, it depends on the needs. Uh, of the application, right? Um, mm. some, some of the requirements, for example, around key management, some customers mm -hmm. must require, you know, they have to own the key material, right? Mm. And, you know, th in, in this case, you might be better off using an HSM, right? Hardware security module is just a standard mm. key service. Um, I also see uh, using CloudFormation affects security positively in the chat. 
Uh, yes, it does, because in graph formation, remember graph formation is simple as JSON or YAML document, right? Um, so cloud formation, you can set security, you know, your security posture in the cloud formation template and that be part of your deployment. Mm -hmm. For example, you can define security rule, rules, you can define NACL or network access control list, you can define, you know, IAM rule, uh, roles and permission and IAM policies, all that mm -hmm. goes right into your uh, cloud formation and actually, that is the recommended way. So this way, you're automating this, you're testing it, you're finding out these problems, you're fixing it, and then it becomes part of your deployment script. So you don't have to uh, worry about, you know, uh, manual errors, basically, or human errors, if you want. So it does, yes, and uh, does impact yeah. positively and recommend it. Yeah, yeah, uh, of course. Uh, always use the security best practices. But uh, if you can check those, yeah, you have consistent deployments. You can re replicate those deployments. You can have like a version control. You can validate your templates. And there are a lot of uh, resources and tools that could help you to check the security inside your template or maybe optimize it. You can create a stacks and apply policies to those stacks. Uh, you have the rollback option and drift detection, so you can check if any of your original deployment was uh, modified, uh, changed, I don't know, um, deleted, something like that. So yeah, you, you can use that, but basically, uh, I think that using CloudFormation, and as Hamdi already stated, uh, is um, in overall is very positive uh, uh, for the security posture. Thank you guys. That's that's a great answer and questions that we had in the chat. We will, I know our time is up, um, mm -hmm. but you have our contact information. So if you have any questions or you require any other information, please feel free to contact us, either Hamdi, Andres, or myself. Um, and well, thank you, Hamdi. Thank you, Andres, for all your insights and information. If you have any other questions, like I mentioned, please write them down. I know we we still had some to answer, so we will get back to you with um, the video that we recorded and our presentation. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Hamdi. Thank, thank you, you Andres. Thank you all. Bye, guys. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye.